Baby. I'm wondering why the questioner talks about farmers having a bad time. Some farmers did. If it had been agricultural labourers, the point would have been even more obvious. After the last war, I saw more of miners than I did of farmers. I think everyone, or rather most people, had a bad time. And our hope is that after this war, we'll have a more balanced economy, that we'll have to build up the life of the countryside, that we'll have to make it more possible, especially for children and young people, to reach their own countryside. And uh, in farming, there's a great development, of course, in vegetable growing and all sorts of experimental work we've not yet tackled in this question country, so that I think that if we make a success of the general plan, then the farmer will come out very well. Henry, I'm sure well, the farmers will appreciate very much these tributes that have been paid to them. The next <laughs> question comes from Mrs. Johnson of Burnley, and she asks, is it true that human beings change biologically every seven years? Do we change every seven years? Huxley? Well, as put that way, it's just a superstition. There's, there's no particular virtue in seven years. We're changing all the time. I mean, living, living substance, protoplasm, is, somebody once said, it's like an eddy in a river. Materials come in from the outside in your food, and then it's, it's built up, and then it's broken down again, so that what is preserved is a pattern of living substance in, into which and out of which uh, living substance is continually going. And it certainly isn't true that this takes a definite time for all tissues, and at that time is seven years. Most tissues may be much less. Some tissues may, might be longer, like part of your hair or your teeth. Well, the answer is no. In general terms, as applied to the human race. As applied to women, it's probably different altogether. <laughs> uh, next question comes from uh, Margaret, uh, Margaret of Essex, a young lady who's just got her first vote. And she asks a nice simple question we ought to get through in a very few moments. What is the difference between the left and the right in politics? <coughs> Dad? Well, I think the main difference, uh, we've had some question rather like this before, is a difference in the belief in human nature. If you are on the left, you believe on the whole that human beings are improvable, possibly indefinitely improvable, and you've only got to pass the right acts of parliament and make the right economic arrangements, and you, in fact, introduce something like the millennium. Indeed, a world of prosperous, properly psychoanalyzed communists would be perfection. And now, if you're on the right, you believe in more or less in the doctrine of original sin. You think that there isn't a very great deal that you can do with politics and economics. You can keep society reasonable, but you can't improve it indefinitely because of the, your view of the stuff of which human nature is made. I, on the whole, take the right view of, as to the nature of human nature, but nevertheless take the left view in politics that it can be improved a bit. Well, that's a very uh, shrewd position to take up. Um, <laughs> Miss Lee? Well, uh, I think it's becoming increasingly <coughs> difficult to know the difference between the left and the right, many of our own current politics. I agree partly with what Professor Jold says. You do have an evangelical, if you like, sentimental left that goes back to the tradition of Rousseau as much as anything, which says that human nature is good, corrupted by society. Therefore, you can improve it indefinitely. Then, of course, you've got another left that prides itself on being extremely scientific, extremely materialistic, which bases its claims for the social control of economic resources on the basis that if we don't do that, then society collapses about us. But I don't know any English author who puts the difference better than Thomas Jefferson, the great American writer, who says essentially there are some people who fear their fellow citizens and try to keep them under by force and authoritarian methods. And there are others who want to trust the common man and they want to build them up to higher standards of civic rights and of material opportunities. Well, you can go on talking indefinitely, but uh, that's one of the small differences. Which is which? Well, I said to begin with, it's sometimes <laughs> difficult to know. Well, you, you, you better guess that. Uh, Elliot? Yes, I think there's... Uh, McCulloch has just said, you've got to guess that. There are some people who fear their fellow men and wish to keep them down by force, and there are some people who believe in the uh, perfectibility of the human race. What we are afraid of just now, I think, is rather ourselves and our fellow men. We realize that the doctrine of original sin isn't a chimera of the yeah, theologian, yeah. but it is, in fact, one of the big wellsprings of human character, and that we begin to realize that you can't cast away all the uh, conventions and restrictions not so much because of what others would do to us as because of what we should do to ourselves. And I think the right does believe that uh, 
you've got to have a fairly strong framework of society and that the weakening of that framework is on the whole a great evil and that uh, changes to that framework should be made with as great care as one would make changes to the framework of a steel building which one was living in at the time. We are, after all, not living outside this, but inside this, and therefore the right, I think, uh, desires to go slowly and change. The left believes that the, uh, the margin of safety is almost infinite and that a very great deal of change can be made which we fear to undertake uh, simply because of timorousness. Uh, I am of the right. Mm? Well, there you are. You've got a general idea of a rather complex situation. Probably the fundamental thing to remember is, if you're choosing between a left wing and a right wing, is to remember that no bird tries to fly without at least two wings. Ooh. Next question comes from uh, Mrs. Uh, Mitchell of York. <coughs> Mrs. Mitchell wants to know if the Brain Trust can explain the popularity of astrology as practiced <coughs> by the newspapers. Joan? Uh, yes, I think it's fairly easy to understand on the ground of wish fulfillment. Uh, humanity at the moment has a headache, we all have a headache, and I think astrology is the chief of the aspirins that have been invented for its cure. And it, uh, in fact, cures your headache in two ways. First, by assuring you that the future will be better than the past, and secondly, by assuring you that your future is more or less determined for you by the, by the nature of the, of, of, the, uh, of the heavenly constellations under which you were born. Therefore, you needn't trouble, and therefore you needn't worry. What better aspirin could be de de devised? Okay. It's very interesting that, it, uh, that you had a similar recrudescence of superstition in the last war, though it didn't take quite the same form. Astrology wasn't so much to the front. I think you always get it in times of war in modern communities. As Joad said, it's a, a sort of aspirin. And um, at the same time, it, it takes away from this sense of personal responsibility by putting it on some other shoulders, quite, Im quite impersonal shoulders to bear. I think that is a very important function, as it were, of superstitions in, in wartime. I personally think it's, it's rather dangerous. So I, I think it's liable to get one into a very unsatisfactory frame of mind. There, of course, isn't the first tribute paid by the Brain Trust to the science of astrology. Yeah. And in, in general terms, it appears to be the advice of the Brain Trust that if you do want to dabble with the stars, it's safer to stick to blonde. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> the next uh, question about films... Uh, the next question is, is actually about films themselves. Miss Doris Braithwaite of Accrington asks, do Hollywood films give an accurate picture of America and of Americans? Now, a great many people in the Brain Trust have been in America. Huxley probably last. Huxley. Well, certainly don't give an accurate picture of the average American life, which is comparatively ordinary, as most average lives are. It doesn't give a picture of the average life of the small man in the city, and it certainly doesn't, it gives even less an, a, a picture of the average life of the small man in, in the farm. I think that's, uh, the, it's, it's, of course, it's emphasis on crime and G-men and so on. Those all are features of American life, perfectly real ones, but they've been exaggerated. See? I agree with Professor Huxley. The danger of the film is that it, it gives crime and gives the exceptional too important a place. That is, if you take it seriously, if it's all right, it's just for a bit of fun. But I'm also thinking of films like Mr. Smith Comes to Town, Citizen Kane, and I think the Americans make a pretty good show, both at giving amusement and also putting certain problems in a limited way before the public. But uh, certainly not a detailed all-round picture of America or American life. Yes. Well, Citizen Kane and Mr. Deeds Comes to Town, is it? Yes. Surely one thinks of them because they are so unrepresentative of Hollywood. One notices them, not because they're like most American films, but because they are so unlike. And with regard to most That's American true. films, I just thought the point about them was that they represent not American life as it is, but as American life as all Americans would like it to be. Let's say they represent the ideal conception of living for all Americans, complete physical beauty for all women, and immense physical prowess for all men, which is what Americans desire. Together with the view that money is the only possible standard of value. <laughs> Well, Campbell? Well, I, I certainly think some of their Wild West films give a very good uh, feature of American life. I've been out there many years ago, I know. I've seen some of the incidents happen that have actually been represented over here. But I do hope and trust sincerely that some of the films of the underworld are over-exaggerated. I've never been in Chicago underworld, but if, if it's anything like the films, then I'm very sorry for them. 
Well, I think we might leave that question for <laughs> the next edition of Commander Campbell in uh, cowboy costume galloping into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hmm? Question next one comes from Miss Elizabeth Pritchard, writing from an ordnance factory.